Hello and welcome to Sustainable Outlook, a podcast from global law firm k and Gates, where we discuss the transactions, technologies and trends in the sustainable economy. We hope you enjoy this discussion. Please reach out with suggested topics or guests or questions about how we can work together to create a sustainable economy. Hello and welcome to the show. This is Alyssa Moyer. I'm a partner at KL Gates, and you are listening to Sustainable Outlook. Um, I'm really excited today to have Dr. Eleanor Kirtley on the show. She's the senior program manager at Green Marine. She holds a PhD in naval architecture and marine engineering from the University of Michigan. Um, and as I mentioned, is director for Green Marine, which is a leading environmental certification program for North America's maritime industry and was founded in 2007. It's a voluntary initiative that helps its participants improve environmental performance beyond regulations, which we're gonna learn more about in our interview, um, and targets key environmental issues related to air, water, and soil quality, as well as community relations. So I met Eleanor when she came to an event that we hosted here at KNL Gates um, with the Northwest Maritime Center. And she's deeply interested in marine education. We connected over my background in outdoor experiential education and then our common work in sustainability and the maritime industry. So I'm really excited to learn more about Green Marine and what she does for them. Welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, absolutely, Alyssa. Thank you so much for the invitation. So first of all, like I said, tell us a little bit more about Green Marine and what your role is there. So kind of a broad overview of your work and um, how you got to be where you are. What, how did you forge your path to being senior program manager? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so Green Marine, like you mentioned, we're a voluntary environmental certification program for the maritime industry. We will certify port authorities, terminal operators, ship owners, shipyards, and the St. Lawrence Seaway, so both vessel side and land side. Founded back in 2007 in the St. Lawrence and Great Lakes region, so binational and bilingual from the start really an industry-led partnership to proactively define best management practices and committing to taking those concrete actions year on year. So like with transparency and responsibility to really earn the trust of those stakeholders. At the time, there was great concerns over commerce on the seaway with the introduction and spread of aquatic invasive species. So Green Marine was founded to really earn that trust to show that the maritime industry could continue operating with environmental stewardship. And we've kind of grown from there. We had an initial scope, seven performance indicators. Now we've doubled that, looking at impacts to air, land, water, and communities. Geographically, we've grown from the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence to the West Coast, East Coast, and Gulf. I opened up our West Coast office in Seattle, Washington in 2014. And so now we have three offices, Seattle, Quebec City, and in Nova Scotia. We are a team of seven across those three offices. As program manager, I mean, my main role is to really help our participants through that certification process. It's an annual process. So we kick off every year in January, reviewing any updates to the program. Every year we're updating the program to stay above and beyond regulations. Participants will conduct a self-evaluation that is due March 15th. To get certified, our participants have to get their results verified by one of our third-party accredited verifiers by early May. And then the annual cycle culminates in our conference called Green Tech. We host that in a port city every June, alternating between the U.S. and Canada and between our different geographies. I'm super excited that we're hosting our Green Tech 2023 in Seattle. I myself am originally from the Chicago area, studied mechanical engineering and a minor in architectural studies outside in the Boston area for my undergrad and was a competitive rower. And it was through that that I discovered that there was this field of naval architecture and marine engineering. I got to study that formally during my junior year abroad at University College London and really just fell in love with it. It was very much an application of mechanical engineering properties and lessons, but to something that was so much more tangible and fun, like a boat. So I went to grad school in Ann Arbor for four years, had a wonderful experience there. 
and then got my first job out in Seattle at Gloucester, where I was a consulting engineer and analyst in their ocean engineering group. My culminating projects were really on vessel traffic risk assessment studies. So it was there that I really got to broaden out my perspective from a single vessel and how do you design an environmentally friendly vessel, but the system in which that vessel operates. So where it's going to and from and where it's taking on fuel and how is it impacting the other vessels in the vessel traffic system. So all throughout kind of looking at metrics and how you quantify performance. So then in 2014, when Green Marine decided to open up a first West Coast office and a first office in the U.S., I, I, took, I took the leap to become their first uh, outside program manager. So when you talk about kind of like the vessel systems and like where they're fueling, that kind of leads me to, to ask the question for a lot of listeners who might not be really familiar with the maritime industry. I mean, I even, I sit here in Seattle and I look out at the port, right? But it's a kind of a big mystery to me in a lot of ways. Um, and, and, then, and then linking that to sustainability, why should our listeners care? They, they come from all sorts of backgrounds and professions. How does the maritime industry kind of touch our everyday lives and how are we impacted it? And why should we care about sustainability in that industry? Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, I think you have really touched on it that too often maritime is kind of out of sight, out of mind, like literally out to sea. We don't see it. But then we live in Seattle, which is this super rich, culturally rich area for maritime. My office is at Fisherman's Terminal. I can look out the window and see pleasure yachts and fishing boats and so much of the variety that is even just right here in our city. But I mean, so much we think of shipping and we think of the Amazon box that arrived at our doorstep. But really, that Amazon box probably had a leg of its journey on an ocean going vessel or it had coastal or inland transportation as part of its journey to our doorstep. So as consumers, maritime touches our everyday lives. And then say we go on vacation on an Alaskan cruise or we take a ferry to Bainbridge or a recreational sailor or a one time competitive rower. I mean, it touches all of our lives. I mean, anyone who eats seafood, I mean, that came from the ocean as well. You know, I don't think of myself as a very maritime centered person. And yet I take a water taxi almost every day. Right. I go out on my paddleboard pretty routinely. And I and it is definitely a part of my landscape, even though I don't identify myself as you know, part of that necessarily. But I, I guess that I am. And it's interesting too to think about the links through, you know, the West Coast and the Midwest and the East Coast and how different it all is, and yet how connected it all is too. I mean, I spent for part of my college years educating people around aquatic exotics in the Midwest, zebra mussels and Eurasian water milfoil, and, and how profoundly that impacts you know, that area of the country too. So I agree, it really does touch so, so many parts of our lives without us even thinking about it. Yeah, without us even thinking about it, like coming from the north suburbs of Chicago and going to overnight camp in northern Wisconsin for a decade, like I didn't even think that maritime was a career path for me. It took many degrees later to really <laughs> find to find my role now. I'm very grateful for my path that I got here, but my path is not totally transferable or accessible to other youth who are interested in the maritime community. I think that's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about expanding those opportunities and especially making sure that as we have an aging workforce largely represented by white men, that the new generation coming up is representative of the diverse population that we have outside of maritime. Agreed. For our listeners to know, um, the Northwest Maritime Center is working together with a uh, public school district here in Seattle and the Port of Seattle on a maritime high school. So um, trying to make sure that um, everybody knows they can be a part of this industry. And Eleanor really touches on a key component. There's kind of this silver tsunami within the industry of retirement and people aging out. And so part of the efforts that she and I were engaged in with the Northwest Maritime Center is to grow the awareness of this high school, which is really exciting, I think. So tell me a little bit more. Let's break it down a little bit more. You told us about what Green Marine does. How do you do it? So what are the ways that it accomplishes its mission? Are is there policy regulatory targets? Who are some of your partners? You mentioned like third party verifiers. But can you kind of get into the weeds a little bit more? Sure. Well, let me start by sharing that our mission is advancing environmental excellence. 
we could go on another tangent on the definition of environmental versus sustainability and how we're growing the scope of the program. Uh, our approach is really to be inclusive and collaborative and consensus based, really get the right subject matter experts at the table, as well as those who are the users and who are going to be well positioned to implement the best management practices. So that means we host a lot of meetings, a lot of facilitation with sending out a doodle poll, writing an agenda, making sure everybody's sort of on the same page when we write out our minutes with concrete action items to make progress and move ahead. That every year we're looking at a number of the performance indicators in the program, particularly when there's new regulations coming into force, to make sure we're taking out criteria that are no longer voluntary and writing in the latest best management practices for technologies or operations that are really reflective of what our participants are doing or aspire to do. So we're writing this framework of 14 different performance indicators, each identifying criteria on a scale of levels one to five. So trying to be broadly applicable across the great diversity of participants in our industry, really finding where there is common ground that we can all agree, like, yes, energy efficiency lighting is a good measure to take on. Let's report to it and get credit for it and just have that network effect, bringing people together to share those lessons learned, to share the success stories. I mean, a lot of our conference every year is that bringing people together, but then we have a whole suite of communication tools to share those success stories that aren't captured in that numeric leveling of levels one through five of our performance indicators. So really recognizing that like it's not a perfect solution. It's not a one size fits all solution, but we now have 15 years of experience of this iterative annual cycle getting better and better continual improvement every year to show that we have like demonstrable results of environmental performance by our definition of what it means to be green. So we very much are, you know, grateful and reliant for our members and subject matter experts who will volunteer their time to help inform the program to make sure it's like usable and applicable and it like makes sense for the industry to take on. So offering kind of like those tools and services of sort of sometimes I call it an off-the-shelf environmental management plan of measures that are really vetted and adopted to kind of get that twofer of I'm going to do it, so let's also get a green rain certification for it to help then communicate with my stakeholders that I have this commitment for environmental stewardship that will be annually maintained. How did you figure out some of those indicators and parameters? I mean, I know you have an engineering background um, and I'm assuming others on staff have similar backgrounds. Did you also partner with different maritime industries that are doing these evaluations or tell me a little bit more about those partners? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So within our membership, we have the participants who are those who get Green Marine certified. Additionally, we have association members that may be industry advocates and then we have government agencies and environmental groups and partners that may be the right subject matter experts. So the way we work with all of those stakeholders is we'll form a work group. So, for example, I'm managing our ship owners greenhouse gas work group, and we make sure that we have a good cross representation across like those different bodies. They'll make recommendations on program updates to the technical committees where really all of our participants just get to weigh in give formal feedback on any updates to the program. And then it's really our advisory committees, our four regional advisory committees. We have West Coast, Great Lakes, St. Lawrence, and North Atlantic that are identifying which performance indicators are due for maintenance every year, but also the new emerging issues. So like, how do we pick what to work on? For example, it was my West Coast advisory committee back in about 2014, 2015, that had recognized that the southern resident killer whale and the impacts due to underwater noise was of great concern. And there was not a regulatory baseline that was going to force shippers to quiet their vessels. And so Green Marine got to form a work group and worked over two, three years to really come up with those levels of performance to roll out the performance indicator. We've since introduced ship recycling. We've introduced community relations 
We're now working on a new performance indicator on aquatic ecosystems, which will be for the land side participants kind of building up some criteria that we had around aquatic invasive species. So it's that like collaborative approach to get people around the table to kind of inform where can we best focus our efforts, that there's no shortage of good work to do um, in an environmental nonprofit. So it's a lot about prioritizing and understanding what our members really want from us on staff. So it sounds like it's really collaborative with your membership, right? So like we're hearing these issues. What are you hearing? How can we work together to solve them? What's practical for you and, and what's not? Yeah. How do you, so how do you kind of do that? Like, what does a typical week look like for you in trying to kind of execute that concept? Yeah, well, I guess right now we have, I think like five different work groups in various different stages. So even in one week, one work group, we may be identifying who's going to be on the roster, who's the right subject matter expert, who's going to come from Coast Guard, who's going to come from the environmental group. Um, we got to get this guy on it because everybody listens to what he says, for example, getting that nice group out. And then we have another work group meeting next week. I don't know if they've got their package out. We always try to get proposals out in advance so people can come prepared to participate in the conversation. So I'll be reviewing briefing notes. I'll be reviewing minutes from a prior meeting. We just had our info sessions this week. So all of our participants had the opportunity to join a big Zoom call where we were reviewing changes from 2021 to 2022. So for the ship owners, that was our greenhouse gas performance indicator. So I'm working on PowerPoint slides and I'm trying to make sure that the English version is the same as the French version. And we're trying to like PDF all of that and put it up on our members section and make sure everybody has their logins. Like there's just a lot of mechanics and logistics that go into it. We've got great feedback on this aquatic ecosystems performance indicator that's under development. We just got new feedback out of California. That's a little different than we've heard from all the other states and provinces. So how do we incorporate that and really find that commonality? And that is not at all my technical background. So it's kind of trusting my teammates and identifying those champions who, you know, have taken to heart our mission and are really trying to advance that from their operational perspective of what is possible um, to go above and beyond. Cool. That sounds like you're learning a lot all the time, probably more yeah. than sometimes you're ready to, <laughs> to absorb in a given week. Do you yeah. ever get to just get out on the boats or down into the port? Or I have a trip scheduled in a few weeks. Um, one of our association members, American Waterways Operators, is having their summer safety meeting. And so I'm going to get to tack on a meeting with one of our participants there, the Illinois International Port District, and one of our terminal operators, QSL, who operates the NASCO terminal. So given that I have a very academic or office-based background, anytime I have the opportunity to get a tour, I am all for it. Another time that that comes up is through our verification quality assurance. Program managers may shadow a verifier to kind of come along and see how the process really works in person. And sometimes a tour is offered then as well. Well, that's great. I was able to go to Port Townsend for a board meeting for the Northwest Maritime Center, and I didn't get to get out on the on the boat that they use for their marine education, but I got to tour it. So I was very excited to be on the water. Um, yeah. And as a very office-based person, I take advantage of those as much as I can, too. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to kind of combine a couple questions. Um, I'm curious about kind of the lessons you've learned in your work and or what's been the most like, surprising or thrilling aspect of what you're currently doing. I've been in this position now for almost eight years. So I've definitely gained an appreciation for how long it takes to sometimes get stuff done. and how long it can take to get the right decision makers in the right positions and just how much of what we do is based on relationships and developing that trust and understanding what communication style works best for different people. I know this person, I really just need to text them. I know this person, I need to ping them at three week intervals. Um, I've kind of become like a professional pinger um, <laughs> and just maintaining that dialogue with the people who I need around the table. And just remember that we're, we're playing the long game. Have some patience, stick with your team and stick with your people like through their ups and downs. We've, we've all had them. Um, we all have those days. Um, so just trying to, you know, 
be patient and understanding, have a little optimism and faith that we're all just trying to do our best each and every day, um, that really in the long run, that engenders a lot of like loyalty and generosity coming back. I have found some other lessons that I think people have tried for me to learn um, <laughs> is, you know, keeping up with current events. Um, really being respectful of the context that we're operating in. Um, sometimes as a professional pinger, it's really easy just to be like, hey, have you done this yet? But instead, take a minute to look at their website. Do they have new news? Has something happened worthy of congratulations? Showing that like I have some skin in the game too as to what matters to them, that this is a mutual relationship. So what are they getting out of it? from me? How can I add add value to that email? If it's an interesting news article, if it's funny clip art, you know, just a way to foster that relationship and recognize that broader context. So like what happens to fuel prices when there's a war in Ukraine? What happens when somebody missed their ferry because they had a staffing shortage? That we're all kind of operating not just in our day jobs, but our day jobs exist within a broader life of juggling many, many roles. I really appreciate you saying that because sometimes it's so easy to just kind of get lost and like, here's my to-do list and I've got to reach all these things and I'm just going to keep this really direct because I got to keep moving. And the difference it can make with whoever you're working with to just stop, take a breath, try to remember what's going on for them personally or how they may be impacted by world news and, and then go from there. Oh my gosh. Yes. Definitely don't email a participant that just was in a hurricane pinging them for input to your proposal. Like Eleanor, like think this through. And there's regional differences. Some people really resonate with more of the chit chat and familial language in conversations. Other people are very much like, here's my quick response sent from my iPhone. So yeah, appreciating the regional differences, appreciating the catastrophes that may be going on, recognizing that we're just trying to trying to do better day in, day out. I would love to keep exploring that because I, that, that kind of psychology in the workday really, really fascinates me. But I do want to make sure that we get to talk about kind of what you see coming around the corner in the maritime industry, in that intersection with sustainability. What do you think is kind of the next big or the next few big things in three to five years that you will be working on? Yeah, for sure. Um, I feel like the maritime industry is no longer totally like out of sight, out of mind. We very much have come under the pressure, global public pressure to decarbonize. There is more players, more coalitions looking at how do we do that in a way that is sustainable and represents diversity and equity and the various different technological challenges that we have. We're seeing more progress towards getting around this chicken and the egg problem that a ship owner is not going to order a new vessel to operate on alternative fuels if those fuels don't have a reliable supplier. So how do we extend that kind of sphere of influence to get that critical mass of people around the table? Is it one ship? Is it a fleet of ship? Is it a corridor of ships that we can really make that step change, not just incremental improvement, but step change towards decarbonization? We touched on workforce. Kind of on the other side of that is the idea of autonomous ships. How do you get people off ships? Is it more safe to have them managing the ships from shore side? And then you don't have to have the systems on board the vessel to support the crew. And of course, there's sticky issues with that as well. Um, but in the next three to five years, we'll probably see more interest in autonomous ships. We'll probably see more interest in wind propulsion and offshore wind. Definitely more push in the DEI, or I've heard of it recently as JEDI, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. I think, what am I, an elder millennial? I think the next generation coming after us is absolutely committed to climate, to sustainability. Um, and the maritime industry has an opportunity to capture that enthusiasm or to garner that enthusiasm in the next three to five years and 30 to 50 as well. Autonomous ships, I didn't, like I said, there's probably something I haven't even imagined yet. And I hadn't imagined autonomous ships, but that makes so much sense when you talk about the system. So that's fascinating. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us on the podcast. I feel like we're going to have to do this again because I feel like there's so much more that I would love to learn, particularly with our connection with the Maritime Center and the Maritime High School. 
So I'm just really glad that you kind of opened our guests' eyes up to these, all of these considerations in the maritime industry. And I hope that it leads to just more good work and collaboration. So just thanks again. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Alyssa. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode of Sustainable Outlook. To listen to past episodes and receive notices for new episodes, subscribe by searching Hub Talks, that's H-U-B Talks, in your favorite podcast app. We hope you will tune in next time to learn more about the outlook of the burgeoning sustainable economy.